definitely of our design related discipline and engage with people who we may not meet otherwise or get a chance to talk to. So as students, you should think of these talks as starting points for connecting these new fields with your own future practice. And uh, keep in mind that any discipline provides points of contact and inspiration for your work. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, even while the talk is going on, please put them on the Zoom chat box and we'll get to them at the end. Uh, we'll have a Q&A session for about uh, 10 minutes. <clears throat> um, all right, so today we have with us Priya Kurian. Uh, Priya, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and uh, being with us here at CFP. Uh, so uh, Priya is a children's book writer, illustrator, comics maker, doodler, lots of stuff. Uh, she has directed educational films and in 2019, she won the Big Little Book Award for her contribution to children's literature in India. Um, I'm going to keep this very short because I'm full stuff to show you guys. So I'm going to stop talking now and uh, hand this over to me. Priya. Thanks, Diana. And thank you all for inviting me here. Um, I think I'll just jump in right away into the presentation and start sort of sharing the screen. Um, Are you able to see my screen? Yeah? Okay. Um, so yeah, so I, I'm, I primarily identify as a children's book illustrator, but I do a lot of other things as well. Uh, I sort of wear many hats in the realm of illustration. Um, I really began doing making illustrations uh, when I was still in uh, college at NID in Ahmedabad. Um, and this was in 2003, so that perhaps makes it about 17, 18 years now. I think the first book that I uh, worked on has now had a sequel after 18 years. So that carried that book itself is, I think, uh, that old now. It's a teenager. Um, and uh, I, so I, uh, since we're, I'm going to be talking about children's books. So I thought, why not sort of go to, you know, the beginning of, you know, where it sort of all began. So I mostly, uh, you know, in different parts of the country, my dad was in the services and we moved around a lot. And I, um, I think I was somebody who used to read quite a lot. Uh, but uh, this was in the 80s and if you, uh, I'm sure <laughs> none of you would know what the 80s were like, but uh, some of your um, people who are senior to you might, might have told you about how little there was uh, to kind of read or uh, how little access there was to any kind of information. And the books that were really available at that time were, um, so India and there was this country called USSR. There was, it was not Russia at that point. Uh, they were great friends. And uh, because of that, there were lots of these Russian books that were available in the market. And that, that's what we saw. So uh, saw and read as picture books. So our first introduction to art was really this. And uh, it was available in different languages, many kind of uh, you know, translations. And we were, uh, I think, at least I was reading a lot about Ivan, Anya, Anastasia, you know, all these characters that, um, uh, I mean, I, I would never meet an Anya or an Anastasia in, uh, in real life, but these, the, you know, the visuals and the, the, the drawings and the kind of treatment that the illustrations had. Yeah. Any kid uh, in their 80s has not kind of gone through this and enlightened phase. Again, you know what, you know, the kind of food they ate. So one would crave for things that uh, I had no idea uh, what that food was. <laughs> But actually, it was really bland English food that they were describing in this really nice way. Um, so, like, jump a few years. Years interview, and uh, there is this psychoanalyst in the panel, and uh, I had prepared like this portfolio of sorts. And very proudly, I had put this, you know, this comic that I had made when I was perhaps in like seventh grade or something. 
Uh, so I was really proud of it and I thought it would impress the panelists. And um, the, uh, they looked at it and they had this very deadpan expression on their face. And the question they asked me was, uh, why are all these characters white? So now the reason like, so it really, it hadn't struck me until then you know, that, uh, or even this is also retrospective wisdom that I have, but this moment really kind of stuck with me. And um, I, I, you know, now, now with the kind of work that I do with children's books, um, I realized that at that point, what I was, was, uh, you know, a victim of what, if you uh, heard the Nigerian writer Chimamanda Adichie, she talks about something called the danger of a single story. So I think what uh, I was a victim of something like that uh, because I thought that for a character to exist in a story and to be the hero of a story, that character had to be white. And this was because all the books that I was reading as a kid, as you know. Uh, into my teens, I think these were, this particular comic is definitely an influence of too many Archie comics at that particular point of time, because there was nothing else that one could read. So this is what, you know, what visuals can really do to a child's self-esteem. And uh, the idea of where he or she places herself, himself in this world. Um, so this is actually, so many of the stereotypes and the ideas of what is normal, or, you know, the, it gets formed by these seemingly innocent things called children's books, um, which is why, so this is my pitch for, you know, working in children, in the whole children's books area that, uh, so children's books is actually serious business. It's not just about writing cute stories or, uh, you know, um, uh, just, it is not, uh, yeah, just about cuteness. It is, there is much more to that. There are underlying layers in storytelling that can really kind of, you know, um, affect uh, what uh, a child uh, becomes or, you know, what a child feels like. So my first book was really, um, I was doing my diploma project at NID and uh, what I specialized in was actually animation. And uh, we had an illustration course uh, some, sometime in, you know, the, in my third year. And um, uh, I really enjoyed that particular course. And uh, I had sent some of my work to this publisher in Chennai called Turika Books. Um, and they were, uh, at that point, uh, the reason I sent it to them was, you know, I saw some of their books in the library and they looked very different from, you know, what, uh, what I was used to seeing. Uh, but uh, very different from the Indian children's books that I was used to seeing. Uh, and at that time, I remember it was when the concept of an attachment existed. Uh, I had an email ID, but I think I burnt a CD with like lots of my work and sent it to them. And they kind of responded and said, you know, why, why don't you? So all this took, I think, months because, you know, the CD had to be couriered. Uh, they had to kind of check it. Um, so it was a very long drawn process. Um, and then they asked me to kind of illustrate this one book. Uh, this was in 2003. And as I was sort of parallelly doing my diploma project, I was also working on this book. And I, again, uh, at that point of time, uh, this is 1999, this is 2002, 2003. Uh, you know, the, the Indian publishing industry, especially when it came to books for very young children, like picture books, uh, it was quite nascent. Uh, and uh, there was this whole, you know, anxiety about, okay, we have to make Indian children's books. So what is, you know, Indian? Uh, so I think I was at that point kind of trying to tackle that thing of Indianness. And uh, I ha now that I look at it, I feel that the solution I came, came uh, to was uh, mostly an aesthetic solution. Uh, so I thought, okay, you know, miniature paintings and, you know, all these crafts that I've, I've suddenly been exposed to at NID. And so it was uh, a lot of the way this book looked uh, kind of was inspired by that. But I think I was too young to kind of um, uh, take it a step forward. 
which I'll explain with my work later. So this particular book, uh, it became really popular for some reason and still in reprint. And years later, I can only see mistakes, but then it got, you know, made this book turned into a very popular series. And uh, it's also available in quite a few languages, including Chinese now. Um, so, uh, so then I was continuing to work, you know, with different publishers. Uh, parallelly, I was also working in a production house in, uh, in Bombay. I was doing, uh, it was a production house that made ad films. Um, the work was animated ad films. So the work was very intense and, you know, extremely, um, uh, the deadlines were really tight. So that experience, uh, though I kind of moved out of that space, what that helped me with was, you know, when you work for broadcast um, and when you're working in a production house, you learn how to finish things well and also keep, uh, keep track of deadlines and things like that. Um, I moved to Delhi uh, for work. I worked with the Sesame Street show for a bit. Again, it was another production house. And after about a year with working with them and making some uh, you know, lots of educational films for children, uh, I decided it's time to kind of you know move out and freelance. And I think at that point when I started freelancing, that was when I really had the time to kind of think more about you know what I was doing with my illustration, my work as an illustrator. Uh, I continue to kind of get you know these stories about different animals and like the, these these are. Um, books uh, published by Penguin, uh, they are, you know, those Rudyard Kipling stories, you know, how the elephant got its trunk, how the leopard got its spots. So these are stories that have been told and retold, you know, again and again and again. And if you see, in terms of style, I'm kind of continuing with that, um, uh, the kind of, you know, uh, style that I used in the Baby Bahadur, which is the previous uh, series of books. Uh, and but at, at some point, you know, I, it, it is, I think, this particular story that kind of made a bit of a difference in the way I sort of approached books. One reason was this was the first time I received a story which was uh, so contemporary. Uh, I mean, it was about animals again, but it really reflected the, you know, uh, reflected the life around us. Um, and it was set in this urban context uh, and uh, it was written, written by this uh, filmmaker called Devishish Makhija. Uh, he makes a lot of short films and um, so he had written the story about this monkey. So on the face of it, if you look at it, it is a story about a monkey. There is a tree that's going to be cut and this monkey along with, um, you know, the other animals in uh, who live on the tree, they get together and save it. Uh, but at the same time, there are these, the way Devishish wrote the story, it had so many layers in it that uh, it made the story much more interesting. Um, and this is, I think this is the first time I realized that, you know, children's books can be political. And it is these underlying politics, you know, in the story, which really make the whole story interesting. So, on, like I said, on the face of it is just about it and you know, these animals trying to save it. But uh, when you read the story, it is also about, uh, you know, it, you draw, it, it is a metaphor for what is happening to a lot of people without power. And uh, he, the place, the tree where, uh, where the tree grows, it's a place called Bargat Chol. So there is that reference to a chol. And uh, for any for any of you who are familiar with Bombay, you know there are these chawls are always uh, sort of um, they they are always under the danger of being raised down by builders because there is this whole construction mafia and uh, all that. So what we decided was let's make the you know the the banyan tree itself look like a chawl, you know, with these balconies and these. Uh, people, these animals sort of popping out of the balcony. So you have that visual metaphor which kind of connects you to that, you know, that the the building, that um, uh, uh, the, the building of the chawl. Uh, and uh, then, so there were these other layers also in the story, like the, the main character, central character, somebody called, is a monkey called Ali. 
and he the way he saves this uh, tree from being cut is by pretending to be bajrangbali so there are these very subtle hints thrown in you know about uh, about uh, uh, being secular about what it means to be a good uh, uh, human being in this world um then i had lots of fun do, doing all, all the character design for this particular book as well so the person you see on screen right now is the um uh, i hate using the term antibil uh, like villain for children's books because you know i think in in children's books uh, there is you know that sense of redemption should be there for any all the characters and there is some hope for even the antagonist so i'd say the antagonist in this book is this uh, person called muchwala so he's a builder he's a contractor and uh, so in terms of detailing i love the kind of you know putting all these uh, and i think it is here that i kind of realize you know there is so much that can be done with books itself and you know you can really have fun yet uh, work on it like seriously um uh, this is another book that i did much later called princess easy pleasy now again if you kind of look at you know the uh, if the name sounds so cute but even with cute books you know um uh, that there, there is that politics that you have to kind of you know keep it so um so what what i say is that all like it is very true that all art is political and why should children's books not be so therefore children's books are political because uh now going back to chamamanda adichi uh i'm so conscious of you know the way i um the kind of skin color each of these characters has what does a family look like you know what is what, how are the what is the body language of characters um i mean you have somebody who is supposedly a queen in this particular story uh, but i mean she a queen can sit in an airplane with her mouth open saliva dripping uh, so so you know what are you normalizing for kids uh so these little things these you know these so, like so many of the or, of these stereotypes are um they so they so uh they so under the surface and that makes it dangerous uh so these are things that you know one one i feel one must be careful about while uh making books for children uh for example in the second image below uh the queen is like um i very consciously made her much taller than her partner uh which is you know the, so uh it doesn't matter it's not really the writer hasn't really mentioned that in the script or the story but as an illustrator uh you just take you know uh, what you do is show but not tell um so you're kind of showing it and there is no there's no mention in the writing about you know the fact that the family looks different from each other or, or the, that the queen is you know taller than the king so i think the, that that's the way you know one can sort of normalize visuals um i also like maybe talk about uh, in terms of process so um how you know so books come up in different ways not all books sort of you know uh, have the same uh, follow the same process in terms of you know what the way you kind of uh, negotiate your way through creating a book so the first uh, book that i wrote and illustrated was this uh, book for it it's sort of it, it's one it's not for a publishing house but for um, a company that used to make subscription boxes where uh, a box would go to a kid every month if a parent subscribes to it and the box would have lots of things and one of the things that the box would have is a book is a story book um and they want the book to have like this um um a sort of international appeal a universal appeal to it and uh, it it was it didn't have to be specific to the indian context uh, so i mean so this is a picture of my niece and she had this uh, standing along with a drawing and she had this habit of drawing things and then 
deciding what uh, what the drawing was. For example, um, can you tell me what this is? It's a diaper. So, uh, so that was her process of drawing. So I sort of took that idea and sort of wrote this story about uh, this uh, this pig who thinks he's an artist, but none of his friends kind of you know uh, understand his art, and he feels bad. And you know what happens after that? Um, and I used this technique of you know this old technique where you uh, you would use uh, ink and straws to kind of uh, blow something out and then uh, create an image out of it. So in the first picture, he kind of shows him something, but it doesn't look like anything. And then he kind of turns the picture over and adds something to it and makes it a rooster. And likewise. So in this particular, you know, in this in this case, it my idea really comes from just this one thing, you know, that uh, one incident or a memory of somebody or, or something someone has done. Uh, my second book was uh, called Amachi's Glasses and this is really for zero to zero and above because it's a wordless book and um, uh, oh, it actually didn't start out to be a, a, a start out as a wordless book. Uh, it it had text in it, and you know it was one of those books where you know the words rhyme a lot, and you know, it was children's books. And the, I sort of said pitched the story to a publisher, and the publisher said, you know, your visuals work fine. Why don't you just remove the text? And uh, that's how the book sort of uh, came into being. I was kind of mulling about this idea for a very long time. Uh, the character of this grandmother is really based on my own grandmother, who I sort of lived with uh, for. A, for about three or four years, uh, uh, and she is from. Uh, uh, so she was a very sort of spunky lady, and you know, um, she could be quite naughty at you know at times. And uh, basically, I sort of get the character and her character story of you know this really bizarre story of you know a day when she loses her glasses and. Um, it's one of those stories where you have to really suspend your disbelief. So some really bizarre things happen, like a cat gets, you know, washed in a tub of water. Um, she wears somebody else's clothes, and uh, uh, so the so the so this I remember that you know after the book came out, it was again quite popular. Uh, but there was a lot of discussion and so this is much later when there are online groups you know there are reading groups and there is discussion about things so the world has become like a much you know smaller place um, uh, so there are these online reading groups where people discuss children's books so there was this huge discussion of you know whether uh, it was appropriate to really show you know underwear and a bra hanging uh, you know inside a bathroom in a, ch in a children's book and so the thing is that, you know, what, um, and it is never the child who is asking these questions. It is always the parent who is, you know, very worried about the fact that the lived reality of India is being reflected in a book. Oh my God. So uh, I think the children are much more accepting of, you know, these things. And uh, in fact, one, uh, one kid I remember in a storytelling session kind of said, oh, there are Amachi's glasses. So he was pointing at that red bra and said, Amachi's glasses are there. And um, so anyway, so this whole, you know, uh, it, it's really funny because I also received a message after, uh, this is many years after the book is published from the VIP, uh, somebody who works at the VIP clothing company who's a, and they wanted me to, uh, motivate the employees by publishing an article which uh, wanted me to tell me the thought process behind your, behind why I have put this uh, article of clothing in the book and what my memory with the brand was. I have poor memories of the brand <laughs> so I, I think I ignored this message. Um, recently I sort of uh, worked on a book uh, for a publisher called Pratham, and the book is called Beauty is Missing. Now, in this case, uh, 
um, the I was given a brief, so you know there was some kind of there were some constraints that were you know I had to work with. Um, there is an organization called the Humane Society uh, India. So they they basically work, uh, work uh, um, and uh, they wanted these uh, books about uh, three domestic animals. One is the buffalo, one is the uh, hen, and one is the uh, goat. And there were three illustrators who had to, so we had to pick uh, one of these animals and I picked the buffalo, uh, which is uh, this. Um, and uh, so they, what they wanted was picture books to be made about uh, the buffalo and they wanted uh, kids to kind of, you know, empathize with the, uh, with the animal and also get to know the animal uh, better. Uh, so we had a workshop where you know they told us about what what are the traits of you know these lots of things that I didn't know like so one of the things was that buffaloes love music domestic and they're very social animals and uh, they react apparent I don't know if this is uh, uh, true but uh, there's also uh, they say that they give when they listen to music they produce better milk. Um, so uh, it so happened that I was, uh, this project came, came just at the beginning of the first pandemic in the lockdown and I found Kerala because of, you know, uh, so there was because of a family emergency and I happened to spend a long time there and if you, if you know the, um, the geography of Kerala, it's really lush, beautiful. So I was sort of thinking about it. I was sort of coming across different kinds of characters and looking at all these, you know, uh, visuals around me. And um, again, I was also kind of looking for stories about buffaloes, whether there were you know, any real life stories that I could uh, be inspired by and uh, on googling I from Kerala I went to Uttar Pradesh where you know there were these news reports of uh, like these these stories about missing buffaloes and um, and all the stories were about these cops being you know uh, cops uh, in these places like investigating the loss of some buffalo so one 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 of the cases was very famous in fact there was this uh, minister from Akhilesh Yadav's um, party called Azam Khan so Azam Khan's missing buffaloes were like it was like a huge news item and uh, one of the things I found very endearing was this particular paragraph from you know one of the news articles where you know these uh, cops are kind of sharing whatsapp photographs of different buffaloes and the uh, and the owner of the buffalo the buffalo who's lost says this uh, this is not my buffalo. My buffalo had a mark on his forehead, and you know things like that. So then I thought, you know, this is a great. Uh, this is a great. I, I I need to get this story into to Kerala, and my story will be about a missing buffalo. And generally, this is my process. You know, the initially I'm just kind of you know making these random drawings in my sketchbook where. Um, uh, sometimes I think mean, this is just thinking drawings. You know, I'm just trying to sort of structure the story. And then it starts, you know, the next step is you start, uh, you know, looking at, okay, how many pages and you really, it starts getting more and more flesh. Uh, so I'm slowly fleshing the thing out. I use post-its to kind of, you know, uh, decide on how many pages and what comes where. And then the next, and then, you know, this, this whole thing of you to kind of decide on, you know, what the characters would look like, who the characters are. Um, uh, you take notes of, you know, there are, there, is, there are some things that you would be familiar with, some things that you won't. For example, I wouldn't know what a cop station looks like, you know, the interior. I mean, it would be very different from a, a one in Kerala would be very different from some. So then you do your research for that, visit these places if possible. Um, so this was my central character, the, this lady uh, who loses a buffalo and of course you know there were these this uh, different uh, this whole motley crew of uh, other characters that sort of form the story um, we, uh, you take decisions on you know what kind of color schemes each sort of spread in the book would have so you have to do these color patches 
and then you make like a rough storyboard where you know uh, these are just very rough drawings of what uh, the book would look like and in terms of the story so you're kind of slowly structuring kind of you know fleshing the whole thing out and there are different stages in which uh, things become clearer and clearer um so yeah these are just drawings of the story from my story board and finally so the so like you do the, when you do the artworks you know you plan to an extent that uh, it is very close to what the story board is actually like but you detail out many more things these are the final some of the final artworks of the book so so in in the story again you know talking about the politics of the story the story has you know these male cops and there is this new female cop in the um in the police station who is the only one who kind of you know uh, takes the case seriously the other guys the, the oh, by the way the buffalo is called beauty uh, and so the cops just find it hilarious that the buffalo is beauty and they stop at that the male cops and so this kind of it's a mystery as to you know so she meets different people and um, kind of you know figures out at the end who exactly uh, stole beauty and why uh, and there is a music angle to it as well and these are like final artworks i like working on actual sized artworks so this you know i use acrylic paints and um, the thing is that uh, i do digital art occasionally but i feel that there is something there is a kind of you know vulnerability about uh, making actual artworks where you know you put there is a bit of yourself there is no that uh, there is no delete button there is no control z so you know you good about human error it makes it gives the drawing character and makes you know give that that the individualism that uh, one can kind of achieve by making actual drawings uh, making actual artworks is i think there is something to that um and uh, and the other thing is that you you know it is good practice you train your hand better hand and your eye better uh, as you know you go along um this is another book i uh, worked with for pratham books uh, it's called sweet memories of butter uh, it's really the you know the life of a pigeon told in the form of a photo album um, it uh, and uh, so the whole whole book is like a photo album and it has these little you know it gives you the entire it's like a biography of this pigeon and the reason i chose a pigeon was i wanted you know something that uh, a bird that is like a is the some there's something middle class about you know a pigeon because you know they you must have seen there just too many of them around they're like human beings you know they just too many they procreate so much and sometimes they're a menace so uh, but again i wanted to have this you know really enduring story about that grows up and um, the kind of family he um, sort of uh, grows up with uh, his life you know, joins college uh, sort of um, and at some point you know finds a partner and uh, and i kind of sort of slip it in that the partner is also of the same uh, sex and um, so i this because you know i have also kind of tried to kind of uh, look at uh, animals that have there is proof of you know animals also kind of partnering partnering along with uh, same sex animals and i remember my nephew was sort of sitting with me as i was working on this book and he was kind of you know i was bracing myself to kind of explain this to him and it was as i was kind of telling the story and bracing myself um he said oh, oh okay so they they uh, at some point he asked me are they married so i said no they're not married so he said oh they're partners so i said yes <laughs> i was like so thrilled so this is this is what i was also talking about that you know it is i think it is the parents who are trying to kind of protect uh, protect children from the realities that uh, we are in whereas i think children are so much about you know what they see what they um um 
the things that they read in books uh, and of other humans. So I also kind of, you know, with, I've worked with different publishers on, I also do these chapter books where there are not too many, uh, they're not entire picture books, but um, um, they just have, you know, some black and white illustrations in them. They're also very fun to do because a lot of independent publishers are doing this, um, are creating these books. And all these, uh, all the characters in these, you know, books, they're, uh, they question adults. They're not, uh, they're not, they're great characters. Some are, they're not perfect children. So it's, you know, great fun. I worked on like a, a, a graphic novel about the life of Indra Gandhi. This was uh, three years back. And uh, this was along with a writer, uh, Dave Tria Roy. Uh, she, um, basically it was uh, Indra Gandhi's, it would have been her centenary year. Uh, and uh, three years back, and uh, what the, this was again a commissioned uh, project. The publisher wanted a book uh, which could access uh, basically those who didn't were not too familiar with uh, the life of uh, Mrs. Gandhi. Uh, this was supposed to be a book that kind of goes beyond just her political life, but. Uh, and in terms of access, like um, I think graph comics and graphic novels, they uh, they can kind of do what a lot of other normal books cannot. You know, they uh, it is so much about you know what the visual makes you feel. And uh, so again, for this, we did a lot of research. We actually traveled a lot. We went to. <laughs> so, like I said, if you're not familiar with something, it's important to kind of, you know, get yourself to that place where uh, you have all the information. So, these are just images from, you know, uh, Allahabad, where we travel. We also, I mean, Delhi was another place that we sort of extensively moved around, uh, just so that, you know, you could get the details of the book right. And um, along the way, you know, you also meet some very interesting side characters, which don't necessarily kind of form part of the book, but uh, are also, I don't know, I might use these stories that I collect from my research somewhere else. Um, so I always kind of carry a sketchbook and make notes and uh, for any project that I'm doing. I also, so my work, uh, I also kind of uh, worked with with uh, comics a little bit, uh, and my comics are mostly, um, you know, uh, stuff that I do when I want to make uh, write personal opinions. I think I'm I, I am a visual person, so um, all my writing has to be supported by visuals. I don't think I can, you know, write like this long prose piece, and so it it is a combination of both. So this was a book that I edited with uh, two other German artists, and uh, it's it's like a this this work actually belongs to somebody else, but uh, it was a workshop that I had led on comics, and it, uh, the pub, uh, Zuban, which is a feminist publishing house, they published this. Uh, it's part of a residency where I was. Um, there were eight German artists and eight Indian artists. We kind of stayed together in a place uh, in the outskirts of Bangalore and came out with, you know, a collection of uh, comics in a book uh, called The Elephant in the Room. Uh, out here again, I was sort of drawing on the personal story of my uh, maternal grand grandfather. He sort of disappeared very mysteriously and there was, there's no information really about him. So this was a comic that um, sort of, I'm sort of digging into uh, the past and uh, also finding out things about, you know, my grandparents' marriage and their life uh, or how that sort of kind of changed my opinion about my grandmother herself, uh, uh, my grandmother. So, you know, whereas, um, so it was really a way of uh, recording uh, uh, recording a part of a story that had not been told, a personal story that had not been told. Uh, this is again for a magazine. Uh, uh, so a lot, 
like a lot of these stories are you know uh, a lot intersection it's it's somewhere in the intersection of animal human conflict and um uh, i think a lot of some of my comics deal a lot with that you know aspect of uh, life uh also you know opinion pieces this is something i did for the indian express at the start of the pandemic you know when uh when the migration happened and the sudden lockdown was uh uh imposed on um uh, on the country and what you know what it, it was sort of you know that idea of what the lakshman rekha is and uh, the lakshman rekha before the pandemic and you know after the pandemic um so like i said you know i kind of, as an illustrator i think it helps if you don different hats uh because uh you kind of you know i think now uh, uh you are expected to also be kind of you know uh, to to be able to kind of um move from one thing to the other so things have sort of changed in terms of the industry itself um now there are like there are so many things like apps and you know uh, everything is visual these days i mean if you pick up a newspaper there is so it's not like newspapers were earlier right there was there are so many more photographs so many more illustrations so in the, in, in that sense i think the world has definitely become more and more visual now and so a lot of my other work is you know for adults uh, which is you know i do this thing regularly with the mint lounge where i do portraits of these corporates they have a section where they profile you know uh, a corporate every um, every week so this is something that i did for a hotel in uh, kerala uh, this is you know for one of their uh, rooms Uh, where they wanted you know images which is with of typically uh, kerala scenes uh, from the market this is again a very recent editorial for the mint lounge it was their cover story about again the this again it's human animal conflict um, is here specifically about you know elephants and this piece was called an elephant in my backyard this was digitally done uh i work for the bbc sometimes and they do, as for some reason they give me a lot of their humor columns and uh, this particular one was uh for it was about parsis some uh, they, uh, this author had written this very nice piece about parsis and their names uh so this um it, so i i i lived, lived in bombay for a while so i kind of you know uh, i also had a few parsi friends in uh, at an id and uh it was kind of nice to put all that together in this was again for the bbc it was a piece about the nighty how you know universal that garment has become um i this was something i pitched to the bbc and they kind of put it out as a voice uh uh what uh, i don't know what it's called it's, uh, about the pandemic and uh, images of people you know i saw just when the pandemic had begun um i also do a lot of book covers uh and i really like doing them because you know unlike a picture book there uh it's it's like one image so you can really try out something and then uh if that uh works you know you can use that style in uh in a picture book uh i also and also added advantage of you know having you get to read manuscripts much before they're out in the market um and it sort of also informs the work that i do or you know my um it works like uh, i think being able to read uh read the work of people who are really thoughtful and you know are uh, it's and as a somebody who likes reading it's it's a, it's a joy to do you know covers and book covers for people so typically i would you know give many options for the cover and one would get like a very rough option what you see on the top and then you know one would get picked and i sort of work on that and then finally you know one uh, one of the three covers would uh, you would give color options and uh, one of them would get you know go into print 
Um, this is something I worked on with, uh, for Perimal Murugan. It's a book called Punachi. I had great fun doing this cover, and uh, this ultimately this this cover itself, you know, the a section of the book was taken and made into a children's picture book. And because the cover was, you know, in in those three colors, this picture book itself, uh, sort of, and this was totally digitally done. What I actually wanted to do was do woodcuts, but that would have take, taken, you know, many years to do, I think, and, you know, deadlines are important. And uh, so I tried to achieve that, you know, they no cut kind of uh, uh, feel uh, digitally. Um, there's some, uh, this was something I did with the historian work, uh, uh, a book that the, the historian Manu Pillai had uh, written. It was unusual for, you know, publishers to kind of, uh, think of putting illustrations in history books, but I think publishers are also trying different things. Manu is a very young, very uh, really wonderful historian, and his writing is witty, and you know, uh, so it was great fun doing this. Again, you know, in terms of technique, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't move the typical. You know, uh, I had to kind of choose something that was really slightly more dramatic, which is why I chose, you know, uh, these charcoal uh, drawings uh, in terms of technique. Um, yeah, and I love kind of, you know, experimenting with media, you know, again, everything is hand done. These are actual artworks, these are paper cutouts. So, so this particular book is called The Miracle on Sundarbhag Street, and it's about these two, this uh, this old lady and a, her friend, a young friend, who kind of revived this old garden, uh, old dump yard, and make a garden out of it. So I felt that you know, keeping up with the spirit of the book, uh, it would have been it, it would have been it, nice to kind of use you know leftover paper and uh, just scraps of this and that. So the whole thing was really you know made out of you know uh, cutting out. Um, all these papers and you know things that I had collected over the years, uh, junk that I had collected over the years, and typically, like all, like I said, all my most of my artworks are hand drawn. These are, you know, uh, okay, that's a picture of pencils, <laughs> and some are a combination of both. Like you know, you have uh, uh, draw by hand and then color a bit digitally. Um, and yeah, and keeping a sketchbook is something that I, I, I would, if anyone, any illustrator, anyone, I would kind of one of the things that I would tell them to do is really draw and, and draw, uh, drawing is not just, it, it has to be thoughtful drawing. You know, so it it needs to be. You need to look at what you're drawing, really. And half, the, I always feel that you know, half the drawing happens in the mind. It is not. Uh, it is not your hand. It is you know, training your mind to look. And so I, I do this exercise where you know, I, I draw people on the street, and a lot of times you you, know, you these people pass by so fast that it is impossible to kind of, you know, capture them in your sketchbook at that particular point of time. So the best thing to do is really look and, you know, um, and observe things carefully. And uh, I think like for any creative person, the power of the, the act of observation is so, so important. Uh, that's where, you know, I think half your ideas, half your, you know, the, the thing about connecting things, really uh, that is possible through the fact that you observe carefully and observe consciously. Like I always like, the, there's this, this writer, David Foster Wallace, who talks about, you know, this thing of, uh, uh, he starts one of these, uh, his lectures in a college about, uh, and, and the lecture is called, this is water. And, it's about two fish, uh, they meet each other and uh, one fish says to the other, how's the water? Uh, so the other fish says, what is water? So that is the thing, you know, you, you have to kind of be conscious of the ether you are swimming in. And, uh, and I think that half your job gets done if, if you, you know, are able to do that. Um, 
yeah so these are just some pages from so some of these drawings are done uh, after i their memory drawings uh, some of them are um, are drawn while that person is sitting in front of me there's a park in front of my house and uh, i kind of always see these middle aged men come and use it when there are no children around and it's really it's strange because they just come and sit on these you know these things that are meant for uh, very young kids yeah i mean these are the people i draw from i draw for and um, i think that idea of play is very important i you have to kind of i think being creative is just i think a continuous process it's not you know it's not like you switch off at any particular point of time and you know there are so many different ways of expressing yourself so uh, yeah and um i think that that constant again i i can't re reiterate this enough that constant thing of being a good observer and you know wanting to and seeing things that maybe other people miss i think that is uh, it comes with practice and you have to half the thing is you know observation and then practice practice i think every day uh, uh i don't think a day goes by without drawing uh and that really helps um yeah i mean the last year has also been sort of um uh, with with the whole pandemic you know so many things have sort of happened and uh, uh so um and it's also been it's important because i mean in the, the i think a lot of uh, both during the pandemic i saw so many other kids kind of you know read so many children's really that that uh, there's a thirst for you know more and more content i forgot oh i use the word content uh you know uh, the thirst for more more children's books to be sort of available and you know storytelling sessions and things so it's been i think um yeah so i think books are here to stay and but i still get you know asked questions like these like this gentleman you know at an airport who kind of you know asked me when i, I was just chatting with him and he asked me you make pictures for children's books so then like a for apple and then you draw an apple that's what you do right so yeah so i still kind of you know sometimes wonder you know, whether you know people are people really get it but then sometimes you know you do these workshops and then you at the end of the workshops this child will slip you these you know uh little things which might just be like some soap strips or you know some pebble or which you know <laughs> kept so it's uh, in that sense it's really rewarding uh to be able to do this and um yeah and uh like i said children's books are very cool and serious <laughs> i think i'll end there if there are questions i would be very happy to take them <laughs> i think you are very cool uh, priya mm -hmm. <laughs> and i never had so many questions even while the talk was going on i don't even know if we can get through all of them but let's just get the first two questions out of the way because everyone wants to know uh, a where do you get your inspiration from and b if you face a block how do you get rid of it okay. these are two things that everybody wants to know okay um but inspiration i kind of you know I, like in my presentation i said it could be from anywhere it could be a news article or it could be just a person or so um i i think i just i i look around for like actual people or actual so all the characters that you see in my books are really characters that i have seen on the street or you know somebody who reminds me of someone or uh so i think in terms of inspiration there are you know just i can't tell you one way of being inspired of course i i do the usual you know i read a lot of books i watch films i uh, i try and travel whenever i can which has not happened during this whole pandemic time um so i you know try and just just enjoy being alive <laughs> in some way or the other and uh, i do have mental these these blocks but the thing is that you can't 
you can't I, I think you can't solve a mental block it it um usually what i do is i move on to something else but that thing earlier i used to worry about it a lot you know that um uh, in the big i remember that in the beginning of my career i would worry about that block a lot but that doesn't help uh, i think moving on to something else but yet sort of you know mulling over you mulling over that in the back of your mind uh, is ultimately what solves the you know um, i think it is some i think having a mental block probably means that you need to take a you know sort of take a break from what you're doing and uh, and yet it's not really taking a break but just kind of you know putting moving attention from that particular project to something else and waiting <laughs> waiting it out i think that's yeah <laughs> and if you i think i i, I don't run too much there are people who run it out <laughs> okay uh Dairia wants to know uh, how did your approach to politics and children's books change as you shifted from illustrating someone else's story to your own? So th this is this it's an interesting question because I think um, so um, sometimes when you get a story you you're getting stories that somebody else has written and it is that other person's experience. so you you were not fam sometimes you're not familiar with that person's experience so uh, i think i've also been, when i'm writing my own story i have become conscious of the fact or whether it is my story to tell for example i um i would not um for example if it is a story about caste you know and so i would not uh, you know imagine the life of a uh, um of somebody from a particular caste which i do, do not know about you know or say if it if if the if the story demands that the writer or or if the if the book would be better if it is say um, i mean if it requires say a dalit writer or a dalit artist i think i have become very conscious of the fact that you know that person must be the person who is telling the story because that experience is not something that i i have had so you know that consciousness about i think my privilege or you know is is something that uh, is important for a creator so i'm also thinking now you know in terms of who is the creator of the book um so it is important i think to be honest about you write this you honestly tell stories that you are familiar with or you know about you know the life that you know about uh and i think that is uh, that is something when when i'm talking about politics that is also that is also a part of you know uh uh what uh, a part of uh, you know when you talk when you're making children's books those are also thoughts that you need to kind of you know uh have i think so i think honesty i think being honest to what you are uh, to the story okay uh joanna wants to know uh, how do you get more controversial topics in your books is everyone more accepting of these topics now a lot i i do feel uh, independent publishers are seem to be much more accepting uh the publishers sometimes still do have you know um but things have i think vastly changed since the you know uh, in the last couple of years i think there are there are some very interesting books that have you know emerged um and in case oh, how do you get approve approvals i mean um publishers as such i have to say the publishers themselves have not you know uh, they've not sort of said no to uh, something but you know you never know sometimes things that occur once the book is published for example um, like amachi's glasses and it might be the most innocent thing that you know gets a bit blown up so uh, apart from that you know the bra and the underwear which the publishers were totally cool with everyone was totally cool with there was this one workshop i remember 
uh, this the author told me about this workshop where there's this uh, uh, the grandmother is serving something on a plate and uh, it's not clear whether I mean what I had intended was was of course that it was some kind of meat and at the workshop uh, this discussion happened you know between kids about uh, what kind of meat was it so you know so there are these conversations that sometimes become and again ultimately it was the parent who complained you know about you know that this particular thing and uh, so i mean the publisher of course did not you know i mean the book is printed published she did there was there was no way that you know one can kind of change this so what gets politicized is really you know what people make of it sometimes and um, and the thing is that food is such a political thing you know uh, there is so much bullying in classrooms because of this particular thing and but again how do we normalize that we have to show it so much of india is most of india is uh, non vegetarian and it is a fact so what are we reflecting in our books is it the lived reality of children or is it not and then you have you know things like in amdabad where you are sitting uh, um, vendors being asked to kind of so it's all i mean it's all part of that big picture um yeah i hope i answered your question <laughs> um what is the kanoshi what is the best part about being an illustrator and what is the hardest part oh the best part i mean i i i uh, sometimes it doesn't feel like you know uh, work at all i mean i'm i think i'm lucky to be doing something that i i enjoy um and the worst part i don't know sometimes we have difficult clients so that must be you know <laughs> and uh, and uh, i mean i wouldn't say this is the worst part but of course there is a, a being a freelancer uh, it is not uh, it's unpredictable unpredictable sometimes um, but sometimes that unpredictability is also exciting <laughs> so yeah okay um <clears throat> have you written any books for an older audience this is sabya sachi mm, i've written comics so the comic that you kind of you know saw about my grandparents it is for an older audience it's not for kids <laughs> uh Arjun wants to know what what do you think the future of illustrated art is digital or hand drawn hand drawn art I think there's space for both I don't think you know uh, it's an either or thing uh me preferring hand hand drawn art is prop it's 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 sort of uh, my personal preference because of the reasons I mentioned you know but uh, I think there are digital artists doing a lot of uh, fantastic work um i think that uh do i do think that it sometimes makes i mean i i see a lot of young artists you know uh, work digitally and i see a lot of work on instagram and sometimes digital work starts seeming very similar to you know so there is i perhaps it's just my unpopular opinion that you know it, there is a sort of tendency to kind of flatten out and look very generic you know so uh, unless you kind of have uh, really cracked that digital i mean the digital medium is like another medium you know it's like mastering watercolors or mastering poster colors it's just another medium so if you really master it i'm sure you can have you know an individual style i know some fantastic artists who've actually done that but uh, i think there is a danger of the the illustration looking like somebody else's uh perhaps it's because there there is that possibility to kind of you know clean it clean it clean it clean it and then you know it sort of uh um yeah kind of 
looks like somebody else's work. Yeah. Okay, we have time for one last question. Meanwhile, there are a lot of people who want to tell you how lovely your art is and all that. So I'm not going to read that out. Instead, I've put your Instagram link on the Zoom chat. So people who want to do that, please go there and uh, tell Priya yourself how much you <laughs> love her artwork. Okay, we only have time for one last question. So with this, I'm going to you know end the talk. Um, as an illustrator, you often notice characteristics about people that others wouldn't focus on. So what's the first thing you usually notice that comes to you as a natural reflex? Yeah. First thing I notice. So it is like something that is, uh, I mean, something that is so normal, yet there is a quirk in it, you know, a scene or uh, so something about it stands out. For example, I don't know, in Delhi, like you would see so many characters and, you know, there was this, for example, there is this, um, there was this uh, Kirana shop right opposite my house and there used to be these three men who kind of, you know, sit and smoke hookahs. So hookah smoking is a very, I mean, it's like in Delhi, Gurgaon, it's a very normal thing. And, but this is like in a very urban area. But at the same time, this guy was sort of smoking this hookah. Uh, it's making this, you know, li little rural world in that urban setup. Uh, and he was wearing a Chanel t-shirt, you know, like with the Chanel logo uh, all around it. So that it was just like, you know, you find these small incongruities in a very normal uh, scene, uh, but you have to really hunt for those in incongruities, you know, that, uh, that juxtaposition of that designer shirt with, you know, with that logo splattered all over it and that hookah, which is this very traditional, you know, so that, that whole contrast is what made the scene come alive. So, so just like, like I said, you know, you, that just the, consciousness of you know observing that detail those two details side by side um yeah i think that that is what kind of brings out the character or uh, and there's always that urge uh, especially when i make memory drawings there's always that urge to kind of capture that particular scene and you know that there is you know you have to capture it immediately and there is that tendency to kind of exaggerate uh, that one feature that caught your eye. So if it is that, if it is in terms of the person's features, uh, for example, if you saw that image of a Sardarji, so, you know, that Sardarji on the scooter, just the fact that, you know, that scooter just seemed so small compared to that, uh, that Sardarji, you know, so that is what you know, made me look at that person and uh, I have taken, you know, I have stretched that point further in the drawing and exaggerated it much more. Uh, so yeah, so it's like that, you know, that uh, what you see that is kind of, you know, incongruous in the scene or, yeah. Okay, guys, I'm sorry, but that's all the time we have for now. We are going to have to let Priya get back to her own life, you know. <laughs> okay, so uh, Priya, thank you so much. That was so much fun. And, you know, all the stuff that you showed us was just uh, brilliant. Uh, so, jolly thing. Thank you. And uh, thank you to our Dean, Samir Shah, our program chair, Kathy, and the CFP team for their support. Thank you also to Dhuvika, who's always figuring out all the logistics. And thank you guys, such a great audience, so many questions. So see you next time with another guest. Yes, Priya. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. <laughs> All right, guys. Bye, good night. Good night.